Today on the Skid Factory, we're checking out the We Are Likewise 2JZ86. This is a 2013 Toyota 86. Uh, it is owned by Ben and Jordan from We Are Likewise. Uh, so this was actually the first vehicle that I ever built in the shed under the name Alloyd after I left AM Auto. And uh, it took a long time to build. It's a very detailed vehicle. Um, they had a big list of specifics that they wanted. Um, the two guys, uh, pretty bright, they know what they want, they're very good at styling, that's what they do for a job. And all the things that have done to the car, we had to talk through and get it right. Because um, when you're spending this much money on a car, you want it to look the part and do its job. So the engine, you can't miss that. It's obviously a 2JZ and that's what everyone with an 86 wants or thinks they want. Um, it is actually a 2JZ GE block with a 2JZ uh, GTE head. Uh, it was built by Golby's Parts in Toowoomba. It, it's, a, it's rated to 900 horsepower. So it's, um, it's kind of like a, just a careful rebuild. Um, forged pistons, 10 to 1 compression. Uh, H-beam spool rods, uh, 282 cam tech cams, so it sounds absolutely mint, which we'll show you. It's got just ARP studs and things like that, just reliability things, nothing too crazy. Obviously, a lot of work's been put into the appearance of the engine. All the things that make an engine practical are gone, so you can see all this stuff and don't put your finger in here. Coil packs, uh, Subaru coil packs from WRX, that's something that Miles and I came up with years ago when we were trying to find a coil that, that wasn't dead all the time on 2JZs because the standard ones are pretty uh, prone to failure. Um, the reason we use them over the Yaris coils is that they, they, they're very short and they fitted down very low. As yet, they haven't caused a problem. We may have to replace them with R35 later on if they choose to ramp the power up a bit. We don't, we don't actually know what the limit of them is at, the, at this time. Uh, other cool bits, Hypertune Plenum, it's got a hypertune fuel rail as well, big lines going into it and out. 2200cc injectors from memory, so a bit of fuel there. One of the briefs from the boys with this vehicle is they didn't want any hoses. They wanted everything to be either AN fittings, V-bands or um, Wiggins clamps. So all the intercooler piping is Wiggins, uh, the radiator piping is Wiggins as well. Everything else is AN fittings or steel hard lines. Uh, so Wiggins, super cool. It's like an aircraft grade clamp. Doesn't need any tools. They are quite the pain in the ass to set up initially, but once the O-rings are all settled, they um, sort of go together pretty well. Very easy to work with. Uh, they're everywhere. The whole car's covered in them. On the turbo side here, we've gone with twin GTX 3071 Garretts. Uh, with TL exhaust housings. Why twins? Why not? They look really cool. I wanted to sort of hark back to the, um, the 90s where the, all the, the Japanese companies were building crazy um, like promo cars like HKS and Trust and they often used twin turbos up high. Um, they look pretty menacing. Um, I reckon it looks great. I was real keen. Uh, all of it is made on uh, Hypex, Hypertune Hypex exhaust components. I, I made it all, but it, it's um, uh, they, they, you can buy the cast components, uh, collectors, and, and the uh, the runners in various um, bends and and radiuses and stuff, and piece it all together yourself. So because it was a sort of a custom fitment, 
we, um, we went with custom made as you do. So they do actually stand up a lot higher than what you, your off the shelf um, Hypex manifolds that you can buy for the 2JZ. Uh, and the reason for that is originally it was only going to have an, a bonnet exit exhaust, which it has had. Um, so there was no need for space to route the exhaust out, which is why they normally lay them over. Um, since then, we kind of shot ourselves in the foot a bit because you can't actually drive it on a track in Australia with bonnet exit exhaust. They don't allow it on a racetrack, not a, not a drag strip. That's actually why the car's here. We, I've... Um, made a full three inch exhaust out the tail, right out the back. When you're running a pair of turbos, things do get pretty complicated. You end up with a lot of plumbing, um, especially with water-cooled turbos. So um, Woody actually plumbed up this entire assembly. Uh, it's all uh, stainless steel AN, and we've also protected it all with fire sleeve where appropriate. It all looks pretty neat and works really well. Um, the car does make good power and there's plenty more in it yet. When it got here, FA20 in it, absolutely standard. So it was gonna be a big change to go from that to this, obviously. So um, it was basically a full strip down. Every, all the wiring from the car has been removed completely. There's no fuse boxes and no anything. Um, that has since been replaced with a very simple wiring system um, done by Whitey's Wiring, uh, just to control the the lights and that sort of thing in the car. So it's, um, it's just enough to be able to use it at a track uh, and no more. That's why it looks so clean. It's, um, you, you can't make a clean car when it's covered in fuse boxes and wiring looms this thick. So um, a lot of work being done there. Um, brakes wise, there's no booster. It's just a, um, a Chase Bay's uh, assembly that replaces the booster. It's actually designed for a left-hand drive car, but we adapted it to work with this. It all bolted up, but all the lines that we were supplied didn't work, so we replaced them all with hard lines. Uh, it's got a, um, a bias adjuster there as well. There's a lot of little touches like that um, integrated into this car for purely for the reason that we needed all the space we can get to house everything. Um, starting from scratch with an engine bay, you have to plan everything and try and foresee what you've got to do. Um, obviously twin exhausts, twin inlets, twin intercooler pipes. Um, the twin intercooler pipes then merge into one. So we've got um, multiple Wiggins clamps along here. Uh, we also needed sort of a slip function in here to be able to get these pipes on and off. So there's, there's two clamps on this one, the back turbos pipes and one on the front. That's to allow us to slip away that section and pull it out so then we can then get this section off. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all well and good to be able to join things up, but you've got to be able to take them off. And when you move away from silicon and that sort of, sort of the hose joiner with flex, um, you have to really think about what you're doing because a simple thing like that can cause it to just not be able to bolt it on after you've planned it all out and welded it. And you, you then can't fit it because there's no movement available. Cooling system wise, uh, we are running just a replacement uh, radiator for a 86 BRZ FRS from Mishimoto and accompanying fans. It is an aluminium unit, so we were able to modify it and weld on the uh, fittings for the uh, Wiggins clamps. This is the filler. The radiator doesn't actually have a filler as it's, uh, it's a remote unit on the, in the standard car. So we've uh, modified this top outlet both for direction and for the, to add the filler to it. Uh, it's the highest point, so um, that makes it easier to bleed everything out. The top radiator support uh, has been actually heavily modified. It doesn't look like it has, but originally it, it has a, a, a big strengthening rib that goes down to the, the lower radiator support. Um, uh, with the 2JZ, because it's so long, that, that was no longer uh, able to be fitted. So um, to bring the strength back into this, for the purposes of keeping the bonnet shut so it doesn't twist, um, it's actually got a hydraulic tube wound into it, um, 5 8 thick I think it is, uh, and welded into this, this section here to put strength back into it and also a couple of 
bent sections that tie that to the this other little skirt here on both sides. Uh, after we'd done all that, all the fab work was done, the engine and everything all came back out again. Uh, the engine was all painted, the gearbox was painted, it's all just industrial black two-pack. Um, the engine bay was painted in uh, a sort of a custom purple mix that was to match uh, like the anodized parts that, on the engine, like the Wiggins clamps and the, the front pulleys and, the, and these pulleys here. Um, that was the choice of the lads. Uh, at the time, I was like, oh, you're going to paint the rest of the car purple? And, th and they said no, and I was like, oh, okay. Um, then I realised that I was old and I don't understand these things. Uh, it actually looks really cool. Um, it really makes the engine bay hit you in the face when you open the bonnet, which is what they wanted. Let's go up in the air and have a look. So to help the radiator along a bit, if it uh, hits the track, we've, got, we've also got a Setrab oil cooler. Good unit, intercooler, Hypertune, three inch in here, three and a half out to the throttle body. That's what size the throttle body is. So I've had to do a little bit of customizing there to fit it. Mounting wise, there was nothing to mount it off. So I've made some mount blocks there and it's got, um, it's actually mounted off what was originally the crash bar mounts with some stainless steel uh, fabricated mounts plus that top mount up to the um, radiator support further back we can see the engine mounting the, uh, i've made all the mounting um, to suit the cross member so the cross member remains unmodified it's just using shackle type mounts and just custom made brackets transmission mount on any engine conversion you're going to do on one of these uh, 86s that's where your problem's going to be um, there's actually a, a, a huge brace inside the tunnel that um, houses the original transmission mount but everything's a lot further forward so you can't use that and it you, you can't actually fit the transmission in the tunnel once it's all pushed backwards anyway so that's all got to be picked out um, it is reasonably involving it's got a lot of spot welds in it um, it's a very tedious job to do uh, to replace that I've then made this very simple cross member. The devil's in the details though, to get that to bolt the way it is. Inside the car, I've had to remove a section of floor to reveal the inside of this, this section here, which is a, a very strong structural section of the, of the tunnel. Um, it's then had a, a plate with um, captive nuts has been inserted down inside it and it's all been sort of tied together and then that plate's been welded in there. So it's all sort of um, as OEM as you can get when you're doing stuff like this. Um, one of the big problems with 86 conversions that people probably don't ever think about is in an 86, everything's further forward. There's a big, there's a lot of space in the tunnel and that's actually where the exhaust routing is. And when you put a different engine in it, and everything's further back, you no longer have that option to route the exhaust. So the exhaust has got to go underneath. That creates a problem because with ground clearance, because most of these cars are quite low. So it's always something that's got to be considered uh, when you're doing an engine swap on one of these is where you're going to put the exhaust. So um, keep that in mind. It's not always apples and 2JZs when you're playing around with cars. The transmission is a T56 from a probably 2000 model Commodore, so LS1. Uh, very easy box to get in Australia and quite cheap and also very strong. So it's a, it's a sort of a no-brainer for this type of conversion. It's adapted to the engine via a CRS bell housing, which is also an Australian product. And it uses a Mantic twin plate clutch, which is a really nice unit. Uh, so I mentioned earlier, the reason the car is here is because it needed a, a full exhaust made for it. Um, and that's what I'm hanging off like a monkey bar here. That's a twin three inch stainless. It's all TIG welded, um, extremely time consuming to make, but it's got to be there and we didn't want to sort of ruin the engine's potential by shrinking the exhaust down or anything like that. The other thing we've got to do to go along with the exhaust system is fit a wideband oxygen sensor kit from Haltech, a WB2. 
The engine is run by an Elite 2000 ECU and the reason why we never put the WB2 on it initially is because it had bonnet ex exit exhausts and having two oxygen sensors dangling off the side of that really wasn't in the, in the theme of, of the car at the time. Uh, now that it's got the uh, full exhaust on it, we can then fit the oxygen sensors there. Um, the bungs are already there, ready to go. I've just got to sort of screw them in and, and plug it into the ECU. The Haltech has got a ton of sensors. We added as many as, as was practical. It's got oil temperature, it's got fuel pressure, it's got oil pressure, all the safety sensors that work really well with the Haltech um, to protect the engine in the event of a failure. Uh, shut it all down if any of those things goes bad and also to obviously get data logging capability so you can see what's happening. Um, it doesn't have a flex fuel sensor because it's always going to run on E85, so we didn't bother with that. When we come back down, we'll actually have a look in the boot because there's some serious stuff going on there with the fuel system. But while we're under here, let's check out the suspension. You can see some pretty serious gear in the front end here. Everything's adjustable. Um, I'm not actually sure what the brand of this stuff is, but um, the uh, it's got like short knuckles for uh, extra lock for drifting. Originally, the car was going to be used as a drift car, but uh, after Jordan got T-boned in his other white 86 um, and the car was written off and obviously no insurance at a track, he sort of um, shied away from drifting this one since it's worth three times a normal 86. Um, but it's all still set up for that purpose. It's got like extended rack lock uh, brakes. It's got some serious gear on. It's 326 power uh, calipers and big rotors. I think everything is 326 power as far as I know. Um, this was all actually all done when the car got here, so I didn't really have any involvement in it. It's got uh, really nice coilovers and the whole works in there. Heading towards the rear, we can see there's a lot going on here. Uh, this is kind of a bit of a spectacle, this rear end. Um, the lads actually did all this again prior to the car coming anywhere near me. Um, it's very colourful, but it's also very functional. Is there's a lot more going on with this rear end than just pretty colours, but it actually garnered a lot of uh, interest on Instagram back in the day when they actually did, did this rear end. Uh, the reason why they had the whole thing out is because the car was so low that there was the CV joint failure going on because of the, the angles of the, of the joints. So this diff's actually been um, raised up into the floor and sections removed from the subframe to straighten out the drive shafts. You can see these used to be big bushes. They've been plated in and the, the hole offset's been changed to, to lift the diff up into the floor. Again, big 326 power rear brakes. Um, all of this gear is supplied by that company as far as I'm aware. It's all adjustable. I'd hate to be the wheel alignment guy, there's heaps going on. This vehicle has also had a 5x1 14.3 uh, stud conversion done on it to make it easier to get wheels for them because uh, 5 by 100 really limits your, your wheel size and it's also, um, they're much stronger hubs, uh, the bearings are bigger. Uh, the rears I think are just off the shelf um, Subaru items from an STI but the fronts are, are a, a custom unit out of Japan that I don't know the brand of. Uh, so this has had a ton of different wheels on it or at least three sets that I'm aware of huge fancy things. These ones are by far the best because the wheels are facing upright, which is just my opinion, of course. Beautiful T37s, the latest edition of them, a forged wheel. It's got plenty of rubber on it, so it might grip the road and the rollers this time. Uh, exhaust, there's no muffler. I did my best. I put a couple of resonators in it, but they don't really do much. We've gone with center exit, mainly because it looks cool and that's what it's all about. Uh, it did have, this, this, um, these tips were actually on the vehicle prior when it had the FA20 in it and we've recycled them because it's, someone's put a lot of effort into the, into the plating of it and that sort of thing. So I've sort of just modified them and reused them and matched them up to the, to the twin three inch exhaust. I have had to modify a few things in the rear of the car to get exhaust clearance. Um, they were never designed to have twin three inch pipes on them and it's also a very low car so we've had to, to put a lot of time and effort into it to try and keep the exhaust away from the road 
so it doesn't ruin it because it's pretty it's a nice pretty looking thing at the moment standard fuel tank remains as a plastic unit it was never a problem so we left it in there it obviously has a, a, a much bigger fuel system than just that though so um, we'll have to bring it back down and have a look in the boot and check that out Got a bit going on in this boot or trunk area. The majority of this uh, boot install was done by Matt from 5.3 Custom Metal, our mate that's uh, with the LS1 R32 Skyline. Very talented bloke. It's all hand bead rolled and punched. There's a lot of work in it. And it's also functional because it's holding obviously that very large surge tank that has got three pumps inside it. The fuel system starts inside the original tank where there's a radium uh, in-tank uh, hanger. Uh, we couldn't use the original in-tank hanger because it doesn't have a return facility. So we replaced the plastic assembly and fitted the radium hanger with a, um, like a Walgro 465 pump in it, just a generic in-tank. Uh, it then comes through and it's all, all the the piping and hoses and everything comes in underneath here in the spare, what used to be the spare wheel well and meets up with these um, hard pipes here. Obviously it's all been done stylistically to make it a bit of a spectacle to look at but it's also 100% functional and that's probably not a bad description for this entire car actually. Uh, it is both aesthetically pleasing and it's also a functional vehicle. Uh, it will get out on the track and it will get used and uh, probably the best thing about this car is the way it sounds actually. It's, um, it's really hard to make a, a 2JZ or any JZ engine sound wild because they're such a beautiful smooth engine um, by design. Um, so some 282 cams helps a lot. Let's fire it up and have a listen. Didn't want to turn it off it sounds that good thanks for watching this episode of the skid factory if you want to check out the we are likewise socials yeah they're social media demons check them out i think they're big on instagram go and have a look check out their products they're a smart pair of blokes good friends of ours and uh, i admire their build up of their business they've done really well this car is amazing i'm proud to be part of the build of it um, lots of people were involved in it. There was, they had a lot of their own sponsors and stuff like that. So, um, they'll, uh, let you know on their socials who they were and what was going on. But, um, until then. We'll see you next time. I've seen videos about this. You. <laughs>